Won't you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We pray, dear Lord, that you would now incline our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our hearts to behold. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven. Once and again, Lord, feed us till we want no more. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. And God, we give you thanks. Let us all say together, amen. amen. You may stand uh, right where you are. If you're out there in the digisphere, you can uh, sit up, stand up. And I want to turn to a singular passage of scripture. Hey, baby. Uh, uh, Proverbs 4, 25. Proverbs 4 and 25, a singular verse. Proverbs 4, 25. Amen. I like that child. That preachers are like folk who talk back to us while we preach. Amen. Don't hush that child. One day she'll be, she'll hear be talking to the preacher on Sunday morning, helping you to get across the finish line. Amen. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Let's say it together. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Turn to your neighbor. Tuck, tap him on the shoulder and say, neighbor. Look ahead. Gaze forward. Amen. You may be seated. In in season six, ep, episode five of Grey's Anatomy, a woman dies. Who a burn victim is brought in, her and her son, because a chemical plant had exploded and lots of people surrounding it were caught in the fire that ensued. One of them was a woman who came in with her child with second degree burns which should have been quite treatable and she should have gone home that sec same day but she collapsed. She died of massive organ failure because her lungs collapsed and her lungs collapsed because her airways were completely blocked and after it was all over, Dr. Weber and members of the medical board of the fictitious Grace Hospital here in Seattle began to call in all the surgeons and staff that were on duty that night uh, in the ER, in the surgical units, to try and figure out who was responsible for this woman who came in with second degree burns that were quite treatable and should have gone home with her son that evening but ended up dying. Now. Truth be told, as it is, that almost everybody on duty had had a hand in treating her that evening. Found out that the first person that treated her was Dr. Yang here, Christina Yang, the brilliant young surgeon. She's kind of a robot, has no emotions. She just wants to be great. And she'll choose medicine over a man any day of the week. She believes men come and go and join for the moment, but don't let it get in the way of becoming a great surgeon. She was the first to receive her chart, the woman's chart, but only focused on it for a couple of seconds because she was called off to another patient. And when she was called off to another patient, she handed it over to Lexi. Lexi. Lexi Gray, who's the little sister of uh, Meredith Gray. Meredith Gray, of course, now is married to Dr. McDreamy, which is uh, Dr. Derek Shepard. And Lexi is watching the, uh, watching the woman, but then she gets called off to another burn victim and hands him off to a woman named April Kepner. Now, April Kepner and, uh, and some of the minor characters uh, in the play uh, are in the show. Uh, they 
are treating the woman and her child. Uh, and then after a while, here comes in Dr. Mark Sloan. Mark Sloan, who is a cosmetic surgeon, he has to look at the burns on her leg. So he comes in and he treats her for a while. And then, of course, there is Alex. Alex is distracted through most of this show because Izzy has disappeared. And he's trying to figure out what Izzy is, why she hasn't answered his call. She's recently had brain surgery, has gotten better, but now she's taken off. And they can't hardly get his attention because he's trying to get a phone call back from Izzy, who's going ghost on him on the phone. But he has to intervene uh, when Lexi can't seem to get airways open, and then he has to come and go blind and take a scalpel and go through her throat to set up a trick. And over here, we find that uh, this guy over here, who is now dating uh, Christina, he has to come in and treat her at a point. And all of them at some point in this have had a hand in this woman who comes in with second degree burns and should have gone home with her son that evening, but she ends up dying because of massive organ failure brought on by the collapsed lungs, brought on by completely blocked airways. And now Dr. Weber, who is the chief surgeon, is trying to interview each one of them and others to see who is responsible for this woman dying of a very treatable disease. And after interviewing everybody, we find out that one of the people brought in to interview him stops and says, I know what happened. And then they bring in this woman, a young surgeon intern, Dr. April Kepner. April Kepner has only been on there about five or six episodes. She has top of the line credentials. She graduated at the top of her class. She is a gifted surgeon. And um, it seems that April Kepner made a big mistake. You see, as it turns out that the patient died of massive organ failure because of collapsed lungs, and the lungs were collapsed because the airways were completely blocked, and the airways were completely blocked because there was soot in her throat that was not diagnosed by Dr. April Kepner while she was doing the initial examination when she and her son was, blocked in, was brought in. And that's the first thing you do is check the airways. But why didn't she check the airways? Because while she was doing the examination and said to her, open up, let me look at your throat, a man was brought in on a gurney that had an ax in his chest. You see, when the warehouse exploded and everything caught on fire, he grabbed the axe to try and break the firebox, not only to pull the alarm, but to get the hose. And he was running down some stairs. And when he ran down some stairs, he tripped and fell. And the axe went in his chest. When they brought him in on the gurney, the spectacle of a man with an axe in his chest and the handle sticking up caught everybody's notice and instead of focusing on her patient she stared at the man on the gurney as he went down the hallway by the time she brought her eyes back on the patient she thought she had examined his throat she forgot and said you're good to go and she left the patient with soot in the throat that then caused the massive swelling of her airways, blocked her airways, caused her lungs to fail. The failed lungs caused massive organ failure. And a lady with treatable burns died because April Kepner got distracted. We've been doing this series on keep her picture up there. We've been doing this series on transformed thinking because the Bible says as a person thinketh so they are and Paul says in Romans that be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and of all the mind games we play in life that determine where we end up in life and how well we live life is the ability to stay focused. The ability to stay focused. Focused. And that's what brings us to our scripture for the morning uh, that says, keep your eyes looking straight ahead and your gaze upon what is immediately in front of you. Look, keep your eyes looking straight ahead 
and your gaze on what is immediately in front of you. She got distracted. And the question for you and me today, when we are handling the children that we brought into this world, handling the relationships that we're trying to manage, where we're trying to handle the ministries that have been put in our hand, trying to manage the, the, the people that we supervise on our job, trying to manage the businesses that we're trying to develop, trying to finish the degree programs that we're in, trying to manage the affairs of life, and, and, and sometimes the ability to handle things well is the ability to focus on what we need to be focused on. Gerhard von Rod says in his treatment of Genesis, which you heard our preacher last week talk about when the serpent, that was the wisest creature that the Lord God had made when he came into the dark garden and took a paradise and turned it upside down. He said that the devil defeats us by one of three ways. He defeats us through division, because as Jesus said, a house divided cannot stand, which is why the apostle Paul says, endeavor to keep the unity of peace, in, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, because the devil tries to come even into the body of Christ and gum up the works through division. Because everything we accomplish, we accomplish it together. That ministry is not a lone ranger sport. So if the devil can just turn us against one another, everything we could do and should do together falls through the drain when we end up getting divided. The devil defeats us through division, but the devil also defeats us through deception. When the devil skews our understanding of what God's will is in the first place, because the devil comes through the garden and she said, because I don't know why we always say the devil, he, because the scripture gives no gender description of what the devil is. And a lot of the devils I've met in life were wearing pumps. Now, maybe the devils you met were wearing slacks. But your devil ain't my devil, my devil ain't your devil. How many of you have ever met a devil in Prada? Say amen. And ladies, in the name of equality, you can't call God she, but always make the devil he. Let's be fair now. Let's be fair now. Both angels and devils can be he's or she's. They are them. I don't know what the devil's pronouns are, but I know I've seen some she devils in my life. Can I get a witness? <laughs> she comes into the garden and starts asking questions. What is it that God has asked of you? And maybe that's why the devil went to Eve first, because maybe it was just girl talk. Hey, girl, what did the Lord ask of you? Maybe this whole thing started on Women's Day. Among the ladies, among the girl talk. What is it the Lord has asked of you? The devil just raised questions. We should not eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, for in the day that we do, we shall surely die. That ain't what God said. Said you shall be like God. That deceived them. The devil defeats us through division and through deception. But there's a third way. Von Rod said the devil also defeats us through distraction. When he simply takes our focus off of what the focus should be on, and we foolishly al allow ourselves not to allow, as the prophet Pam South said in the Apocrypha to the Bible right after Revelations when she said, let the main thing be the main thing. <laughs> Sometimes we major in minor things and we start minoring in the main thing. And the devil defeats us through division, defeats us through deception, and defeats us through distraction. And Dr. April Kepner got defeated through distraction. Why are we so easily distracted? Why do we find it so hard to stay focused on the main thing? There are many things going on in life, but there, there are many issues, but is it the issue? There are many things going on in your life, but the main thing. Why do we have such difficulty staying focused on the main thing? on the issue and not the issues. Because in the busy emergency room of life, there's always stuff going on. Why do we find it so difficult to stay focused? Man, part of it is because it's just human nature to be curious. Y'all remember Curious George? You young people under 40, Google Curious George when you go home. Curious George was that nice little African monkey 
and uh, who was always into everything. And the man with the yellow hat was trying to care for George, which was hard to do because George was always into something. And it was, it was a book series that became a little TV cartoon series, Curious George. And it, it's trying to teach issues of forgiveness, talking about childhood playfulness, but it's really about learning that you really can't learn without curiosity. Now, of course, the old saying going back to Shakespearean literature in 1589, a play that talks about that care killed the cat. And it's talking about a cat that has nine lives, and it's the nature of a cat to care. And caring makes you vulnerable. Nothing to get you hurt like caring for folk. Over time, it evolved in care from care killed the cat to curiosity killed the cat. And it took on a negative connotation. And when it talked about curiosity, it wasn't talking about the curiosity to learn. It was talking about that preoccupation with what you think is going on in your neighbor's house. Or, or to say, nosiness. <laughs> Sweeping around somebody else's front door. Thinking the grass is greener on the other side. And it said, being nosy, being Mrs. Jenkins. <laughs> oh, come on, come on, somebody. Google in living color when you get home and see about Mrs. Jenkins, who will tell you everything going on in the neighborhood, but you didn't hear it from her. <laughs> being nosy, being nosy will get you hurt. And so it's, it's our, but, but we're not talking about negative curiosity of being preoccupied with someone else's private affairs, but we're talking about the curiosity that is, that is important for people to learn. If it wasn't for curiosity, the Wright brothers would have never got us up off the ground and into the air. If it wasn't for curiosity, the, uh, Henry Ford would have never set us in motion in a faster way to travel or developed an assembly line, a more efficient way to produce products and take the price down and begin the creation of the American middle class. If it wasn't for curiosity, uh, Benjamin Franklin would have never caught lightning in a bottle and, 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 and Thomas Edison would have never figured out how to turn a light bulb on. If it wasn't for curiosity, the African Moors uh, who developed, would have never developed ships capable of crossing the Atlantic 500 years before Europeans even thought the thought. If it wasn't for curiosity, adventurers and explorers would have never decided if I sail far enough west, could I might actually end up in India in the east because maybe the world is round and not flat. If it wasn't for curiosity, then uh, Galileo Galilei would have never developed a, mic a telescope powerful enough to look into the heavens and confirm what... Uh, uh, Cicero had, had discovered through mathematical calculation that the sun, that the world actually revolved around the sun instead of the other way around as it appears to us that the sun is rising in the east in the setting in the west when in fact the sun ain't going nowhere. It's the earth that's in an orbit around the sun, but everything is not what it appears to be. If it wasn't for curiosity, no one of would have ever developed antibiotics which spare us of things that have afflicted the human body since the beginning of the world. If it wasn't for curiosity, no one would have ever developed a pacemaker to keep your heart on a good rhythm or stents to open up collapsed arteries that lead to your heart. If it wasn't for curiosity, no one would have ever developed the metformin so that you can manage and live with diabetes and, or, and die with it but not die from it or develop the Lasartan to pull your blood pressure down so again, you can manage it and die with it but not die from it. If it wasn't for curiosity, no one would have even developed the Viagra and the Cialis. <laughs> so that an old man don't have to wish for younger days, just pop that pill, come here, baby. Cause I'd still love it when you call me Big Papa. Talking about curiosity killed the cat. Curiosity gave us a, curiosity got us past the ice box and gave us a refrigerator. Curiosity got us from using an outhouse into indoor plumbing. Curiosity put us on airplanes and in, in trains and in cars. Curiosity allowed us to raise our medical standard of living, our financial standard of living. Curiosity gave us a telephone and then a cell phone. Curiosity gave us an internet despite all the garbage that's on it.
Our whole life and the quality of life is down to somebody develop curiosity. Curiosity, curiosity is a good thing. We are all naturally curious. But even though we're all naturally curious, we are all responsible for what we choose to focus on. And that's what the writer is trying to help us to help us to understand. We as curious creatures and want to engage in transforming thinking. The biggest mind game you will ever play is the game about how to keep yourself focused on the main thing when there are so many things that are grabbing for your attention and your focus. That despite the fact that we are naturally curious, we have to be responsible for what we choose to focus on. And the writer is saying, Amidst all of the distractions in life, he said, keep your eyes looking forward to the main thing and let your gaze be on what's immediately in front of you. Now, I need to distinguish between gazing and glancing. Because see, my son, he was on the road yesterday, the day before yesterday, he was traveling to a conference in South Carolina. And um, he, was, he was driving, and he had three hours on the road. So I decided to call him, you know. Daughters call parents on the regular. Sons, you got to pull out an all-points bulletin. Whether you send them money or not, somehow or another, these boys, how many of you got grown kids and know that them daughters will check in more than them sons? So when I knew he was on the road, I said, let me catch him now because he can't say he's in an appointment. Negro, you in the car driving four hours from Atlanta to South Carolina. So I got him in the car and then he started talking to me. And you know, he, he started talking and you know, he's 28 years of age, but you don't have to be an old man to have some things already in life that got you second guessing. How many of my young people know that even in the springtime of youth or in the dawning of young adult years, there's, you still have some moments of coulda, woulda, shoulda. You wish you could push the replay in life and go back and do a few things differently. So I said to my son, who's having some coulda, woulda, shoulda moments, as he's driving from Atlanta uh, to uh, South Carolina, I said, Sam, I said, keep your eyes looking forward, not backward. I said, have you noticed how small the rearview mirror is? Because you're only supposed to glance at it every now and then for perspective. You can't stare at it because if you stare at the rear view mirror, you'll crash into something that's in front of you. That's why the windshield is so much bigger than the rear view mirror because you're supposed to glance at the rear view mirror for perspective. But you're supposed to gaze at the windshield to see what's in the road ahead of you because life is always about what's in front of you. Keep your eyes Gaze, your gaze, your fixed stare on what's in front of you. But the temptation is to gaze at what's behind you. They gaze at what's behind you. See, put the picture of the staff back up there because April, as it turns out, Dr. Kepner was was the scapegoat, the fall guy. See, when something bad happens, institutions, whether governments or hospitals, sometimes family systems, we always got to throw somebody under the bus. Because, see, we want to know who's responsible. See, this guy here, Dr. Weber, who's chief of surgery, he's in with his board of directors because he's in a boiling pot. He's the frog in the boiling pot. And... Uh, he says to Dr. Shepard, who's looking at him with jaundice eye, he really wants his job. And he's seeing some things in Dr. Weber that are concerning him. And uh, he says, Dr. Weber says to Dr. Derrick, after they find out April made the tragic mistake of not checking the airways and the patient dies. And so he says, uh, he says, Dr. Weber says uh, to Dr. Shepard, you got something to say? And he says, I think you need to think differently about who's responsible. And then Dr. Weber says to the board of directors, they're thinking about insurance and liability. For me, I just wanted to know who's responsible. And then Dr. Shepard says to Dr. Weber, 
He says, they're all good doctors. They're all good doctors. But when I got down to the emergency room, he says, you know what I found? Chaos. And he says, too many doctors who don't know each other, don't trust each other. And he says, but chaos has become the norm since the merger that you are overseeing. Your system has become a system of chaos. And in chaos, everybody gets distracted. So the question becomes, since a fish rots from the head, why was Dr. Weber so distracted? Three things. I'm going to say these and get out your way because you know I don't like preaching long sermons. <laughs> That's right. Call his name Jesus. <laughs> it seems that Dr. Weber was distracted on three levels. See if anyone drives down your street. Number one, he's distracted because it seems that his old mistake from over 20 years ago showed up in the emergency room. It seemed that 20 years ago, he had an affair when he was a young resident surgeon. He had an affair with uh, uh, Ellis Gray, who is the mother uh, of, of Meredith Gray. She was a brilliant young surgeon. She was married to Thatcher. He was married to Adele, and they fell in love. This wasn't a hit it and quit it. This wasn't a one night stand. They thought they had met their soulmates, though they were married to somebody else. Don't you say amen and put your business out there. Just blink your eyes. <laughs> and, 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 and the plan was that he was going to leave Adele, and she was going to leave Thatcher. She fulfilled her part of the deal, left Thatcher, drove him out the house. But it seems that Richard Weber didn't leave Adele. And as a result, as a result, Thatcher, whose wife left him, he went to drinking, took another wife, and that's how Lexi was born with, from another mother. And... Uh, and, 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 and Richard went on to become a brilliant surgeon and become chief of staff and, uh, and thought he had buried it deep in the soil of life. But God has a way of taking what was done in the dark and bringing it into light. God, God who owns the cattle on the thousand hill and the hills of the cattle on, will sometimes shake the ground and break it so that steam will come up to expose an underground geyser. And that geyser came forth when Ellis... Uh, Gray comes in. She has Alzheimer's now. The brilliant surgeon has gotten tied up in her own mind. And ironically, in her Alzheimer's, she's living 25 years in the past to what for her was the fondest time of her life when she was in this illicit relationship with Dr. Weber. And she's talking openly about their relationship. He can't shut her up. So now everybody <laughs> learns what he did 25 years ago that he thought he buried it deep in the soil of denial and secrecy. And it comes out. But not only does it come out, every day he looks at Meredith and all of her brokenness and daddy issues because of the fact that her father was gone, because he was driven out because of the relationship he had that destroyed their family. The guilt is eating him up from the inside. He's distracted by his guilt. Donnie McClurkin asks this question, what do you do with the guilt of the past? Tell me, how do you handle the pain? Well, 25 years ago, he also had a problem with drinking. He'd gone to rehab, worked his 12 steps, had a sponsor, had been clean and sober, and like anybody who's addicted to anything, you know that if you're an addict, your first responsibility in life is to manage your addiction. Because if you don't manage your addiction, you will mismanage everything else. If you don't manage your addiction, you'll mismanage your job. If you don't manage your addiction, you'll mismanage your marriage. If you don't manage your addiction, you'll mismanage your children. If you don't manage your addiction, you'll mismanage your health. If you don't manage your addiction, you will mismanage everything in life. But they know that the triggers for any addict is lonely, angry, tired, frustrated, stressed. 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 And the guilt of the past became a trigger. And Dr. Weber started to reach for the old crutch that always became his shackle. 
The powers of denial made him think that he could just throw a few back and it wouldn't bother him. And now he was on the slippery slope because the guilt took him back and he got distracted by his old nemesis, guilt, that then made him reach for the bottle. But not only that, 25 years now in the future, Adele finally leaves him. Not because the affair he had in the past. She knew that all along. They always know. Amen. They always know. She left him because she said, when are you going to put me first? When are you going to retire so that we have some time together? Because surgery always comes first. It's the nature of the game. You promised me by a certain time you retire, but now you've gone Tom Brady on me, and you just won't let it go. So since you've gone Tom Brady on me, I'm going to go Mrs. Brady on you, and I'm out of here. While you chasing another championship, me and the kids are moving on. And now he's lonely. And as Luther said, loneliness is such a sad affair. Lonely, angry, tired, frustrated, stressed. He's got the guilt of the past and the loneliness because now he's a 60-something-year-old man going home to an apartment or sleeping on a couch in his office. He's got layers of triggers. But not only that, now they've come out, the assessment of hospitals come out, and they've been ranked number 12 in terms of surgical units, in terms of emergency surgical units, trauma units. Number 12, not in the top five where every reputable hospital wants to be, but number 12, Grace Hospital is number 12. Grace is supposed to be sufficient. Grace is now number 12 on his watch, which reflects his leadership. The guilt from the past is killing him from the inside out. His wife has left him, he's old and lonely, and his hospital is crumbling beneath his feet. And in the midst of it all, he reaches for that thing to be calling me, man, to be calling me, and be calling me, man, would be calling me. And why you laughing at Dr. Weber, you need to ask yourself in the midst of all that you're handling right now, what is that thing that's always waiting for an opportunity to start calling you? What is that thing that always waits because the enemy don't attack you when you're strong? It attacks you when you're weak. And the enemy doesn't attack you where you're strong. The enemy attacks you where you're weak. My weakness ain't your weakness. Your weakness ain't my weakness. But if you're human, you got a weakness. And you're always to be on guard for your weakness. I think the most brilliant people in the world are these comic book creators. Because comic book creators, they, 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 they use fictitious characters to really treat human characteristics that, that, that find a home in the lives of us mere mortals. And the ultimate superhero was Superman, who was faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, can look through everything except lead and metal, can have laser fire from his eyes. But Superman has one weakness. Even a superman, and certainly a superwoman, you still got a weakness. His weakness was kryptonite. Any fragment of the planet Krypton, his native planet that exploded when he was a child, but in Earth's atmosphere, the same thing that gave him superpowers could make him weak even unto death. And that was any fragment of material from Krypton. And Superman knew you can never make friends with kryptonite. You have to simply avoid kryptonite. Amen. There's an old Muslim proverb that says, temptation is a vest avoided rather than resisted. You can resist things that don't have much pull on you. Huh? You can resist things that you don't like much anyway. But then some things you will never have the strength to resist. You just got to avoid them. And Superman knew that I am not going to sit up here with no kryptonite in front of me and try to get strong enough to resist it. He's, my job is to simply avoid 
kryptonite. Now, because people are cynical and every superman and superwoman got some people hating on them that would love to bring you down. And if they know that you are weak to kryptonite, they'll go out and find you some kryptonite and put it in your pathway to try and take you down because they want your job in the first place. Don't you let Lex Luthor know that you are vulnerable to kryptonite. Don't even let Bruce Wayne know that you are vulnerable to kryptonite because the Batman really wants to be a Superman. He wish he could fly. But you better find you a Jimmy Olsen on the lowest lane that you can be honest with because everybody, if you got a kryptonite, somebody needs to know about your weakness before kryptonite to help you avoid kryptonite, to not let kryptonite call you, to make sure you ain't hanging out with kryptonite, to ask you how you coming with that kryptonite because I don't care how super you are, there's something out there that'll rob your power. get you distracted. This super young surgeon lost her power because she got distracted. She put her gaze in the wrong direction. Oh, it's so natural to look up when you see some spectacle in front of you. But if she had glanced, she'd have been okay. But she gazed. And an addict can never gaze at what you're weak toward. People with guilt and regret over the past can never gaze over yesterday. You can glance at it for perspective, but you got to look forward because it's all about tomorrow. And in the midst of the chaos of life, and life is chaotic, you can never gaze at the chaos. It may get your attention. You can glance. You'll survive the glance, but you won't survive the gaze. You want to know why morning traffic is so bad? Because people gaze <laughs> at an accident. Yes, yes. Have you ever seen traffic tied up, got you an hour late when you left home with plenty of time? Then you get to the accident site, and as soon as you get there and pass it, then traffic is absolutely clear because what was slowing down traffic was not obstruction in the road. They cleared the road an hour ago, but everybody's got to slow down and gaze. <laughs> If they had glanced but kept driving, traffic would have kept moving. But things get tied up when we start gazing at the wrong thing. Gazing because we're just too curious about stuff that don't deserve your notice. Gazing about mistakes we made in the past that we can't go back and change. Gazing at our Achilles heel that is always trying to find a way back into our life. And the proverb is saying here, commonsensically, in terms of transform thinking, because as a person thinks, so they are, that what controls your thoughts is where you allow your eyes to fall. In the therapeutic community, they say there's a three-second rule. If something catches your notice that shouldn't catch your notice, you've got three seconds to turn your eyes away. Because after three seconds, you're engaging and fantasizing. And now you're on a downward spiral of going back where you don't need to be. But if you turn your eye gaze away, the brain doesn't kick in and become triggered. If within three seconds, the first thing, you turn your eyes away. If you go beyond the 25th verse of Proverbs uh, 25 here, um, it, or, or Proverbs 4 and 25, it says, uh, it says, watch, be careful for where your feet go. He said, don't let your feet be set to wickedness. But what he's trying to say in verse 25 is that the feet only go where the eyes are gazing. Amen. All right. If you want God to reorder your steps, you got to have first have God reorder your eyes. If you don't want to end up in the wrong place, you got to first ask God to make you not set your eyes on the wrong thing. Because if you don't gaze at it, you'll never walk toward it. <laughs> Oh, come on, help me somebody. <laughs> Touch your neighbor on the shoulder and say, fix your eyes, fix your eyes, fix your eyes. Because what you choose to stare at depends on, determines where you end up. 
And whether or not you end up making a tragic mistake that hurts somebody else because you got distracted. Oh, what I'm trying to tell you, Sid, if you want to know who is the ultimate model in staying focused, it is the ultimate model in everything, and that's Jesus. You know, next week is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the day in which the church universal recognizes the day when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. A messianic hope that had lived for 500 years since the return from the exile, that God was going to send a, a royal king, a son of God that had supernatural powers to do signs and wonders that would prove evidence that the God's champion that was going to lift Israel from the dust of shame and return her to the glory of the days when David was king and lift them from the dust of shame to an empowered and free people again. And they were always wondering and it's you the one, is you the one, and it's you the one. And they had figured out that Jesus was the one. Jesus was the Son of God. And so on that Palm Sunday, we bring palm branches because it reminds us of how Mark says in the ninth chapter, and John says in the 19th chapter, and Matthew says in the 21st chapter, Luke says in the 22nd chapter about how Jesus rode on a borrowed mule, rode into Jerusalem, and the people sensing that this was God's king and son, they took clothes and palm branches and laid before him as a royal procession as Jesus rode quietly upon a beast. Now, y'all know that if they were having a ticker tape parade for you because you just won the Super Bowl of the WNBA championship or you just won, you just got your new promotion. If they had a big celebration and you are the star of the story, you'd be riding on that beast, but you would hardly be quiet and you would hardly to be staring ahead you'd be waving at the crowd you'd be saying you'd be playing up there but Jesus sits there quiet does not open his mouth almost as if he's oblivious to the crowd around him so despite all this chaos all this distraction Jesus rides into Jerusalem as a man who is obviously focused why is Jesus focused because Jesus knows that the weight of the whole world is resting on his shoulders and he needs to keep the main thing the main thing and the crowd is never the main thing whether your opinion pulls her up or whether that they are down. The crowd is never the main thing. Jesus rides quietly into Jerusalem because he knows in just four days this crowd's going to flip on him. In just four days he's going to have the Lord's Supper and announce at the Lord's Supper that the one who betrays me is going to dip his hand in the cup if me. It's always somebody that you handpicked who's close to you who puts the knife in your back. And since we live in a world full of backstabbers, you better stay focused. Jesus rides quietly with his eyes gaze in front of him because he knows in just four days he's going to be in the garden of Gethsemane with the weight of the cross and the specter of the cross in front of him praying to his father let this cup pass but not my will thy will be done in just four days the soldiers were going to come to arrest him and he'd be betrayed by a kiss from Judas Iscariot Listen, everything that glitters on ain't gold and smiling faces tell lies. Jesus remains focused because in just five days they will go march him from judgment hall to judgment hall on trumped up charges in a kangaroo court that was going to miscarry justice. In just five days, Pilate was going to wash his hands of him, a capitulating judge to more afraid of his next election than doing right with the power that was in invested him. Jesus stays focused because the same crowd that ate the fish and loaves, the same crowd that he had healed their diseases, the same crowd that he had brought sound into their deaf ears and light into their blind eyes, the same crowd that he had caused their dead children to rise up and gave them back to their mamas and their daddies, the same crowd that saw him walk on water, the same crowd that he
he had blessed and healed that same crowd when given a choice between releasing Barabbas or crucifying Jesus said give us Barabbas but crucify Jesus I come to tell you crowds are fickle crowds will turn on you those you bless will turn around and curse you have I got two three witnesses in here don't you focus on the crowd because they're here today and they gone tomorrow Jesus stays focused because five days later he knew that they were gonna beat him up in the barracks he knew that they were gonna scourge him on the rack he knew that they were gonna march him down to fight De La Rosa he knew that they were gonna take him on a hill outside the city he knew that they were gonna drive nails in his hands he knew that they were gonna drive spikes in his feet he knew that they were gonna put a crown of thorns on his brow he knew that they were gonna drive a sword in his side he knew that they were gonna take his dead body down and put it in a borrowed tomb he knew that they were gonna seal the tomb Jesus stayed focused he would not come down from the cross to save himself he stayed focused have I got a witness and because he was focused on Monday focus on Tuesday focus on Wednesday focus on Thursday focus on Friday focus on Saturday so focused that early Sunday morning his father raised him up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand if you want the power you gotta stay focused have I got a witness don't look to the people at the right and don't get distracted by what's going on at the left don't get distracted by what happened yesterday and don't get distracted by the temptations of the day have I got a witness Lord 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 plant my feet on higher ground have I got a witness my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise where fears dismay though some may dwell where these abound God plant my feet on higher ground look up look up look up look up cast your eyes Come on, touch two, three people and tell them, stay focused. Tell them, stay focused, baby. Taste, stay focused no matter what. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. I know it's hard. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Stay focused. Despite the sins of the past, stay focused. Despite the chaos around you, stay focused. Despite the stresses and the strains, stay focused. Despite whoever he is or is not coming for you, stay focused. Focus enough to even resist the temptation to reach for that old thing that only made a bad situation worse. Stay focused. God is enough. That's what every addict has to learn. God is enough. How many have lived to learn God is enough? Because whatever you take a hold of will take a hold of you. Trouble your neighbor one more time for me and tell him God is enough. God is enough. How many of you really believe that God is enough? brilliant surgeon killed a person lost her career because she gazed rather than just glancing and keeping her eyes on the patient in front of her the beautiful thing I like about that episode is that keep playing is that while all of the other surgeons that were on duty that night were questioned 
by the board and Dr. Weber, found out that they had all made tragic mistakes that night. They had all gotten distracted. But Dr. Christina Yang came with a big insight. She said, you know what? Same thing could have happened to us, just that none of our patients died. Her patient died, so she got caught. But it could have been any one of us. Decoded, digested, deciphered, that means, but for the grace of God. So it really wasn't about April Kepner. She was just a scapegoat. It's really about all of us in this crazy emergency room called life. Trying to stay focused on the things that should be commanding our attention and making sure that we do no more than gaze at the distractions around us or glance but never gaze. Keep your eyes on the main thing and on Jesus. Then we can manage the stuff of life because that's really what it's about. Managing. How many of you want to better manage the stuff of life? Your family, your children, your ministry, your home, your job, your health. Stay focused. I want to open the doors of the church. Maybe there's somebody this morning who doesn't know Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins or don't have a church home. I, I invite you to enter Grace Hospital. <laughs> Did you know you were in Grace Hospital this morning? <laughs> yes. We're not a sanctuary for saints. We're a hospital for sick folks. So if you're here this morning, you don't have a church home, I invite you to come. If you're out there in the digisphere, if you're out there in the digisphere and you don't have a church home, hit that button that says, how do I become a member? Even virtually, you can join the body of Christ. And we're called not, to believe, not just to believe, but to belong. So if you're out there and need to become a part of the body of Christ, won't you come? Whosoever will, doors of church are open. Come on, somebody. I got my mind made up. I got my mind made up. And I won't. And I won't turn back. Because I want. Because I want to see my Jesus. Someday. Someday. Oh, I got. I got my mind made up. And I won't will. turn back. Because I want to see my Jesus. Someday. Say it again. I got. I got. And I won't turn back Cause I want Cause I won't see my Jesus Someday, someday Whosoever will I got my mind made up And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus Someday Say it one more time I got my mind I got my and I won't, and whosoever I will, won't there's someone who has come this morning. I invite you. I want to see my Jesus. You don't have to wait someday. till Easter. You can come now. I got my mind. Whosoever will. And I won't. Whosoever will. Because I want to see my Jesus someday. One more time. I got my mind made up. And I won't turn back. Cause I want to see my Jesus someday Oh, I got my mind made up And I won't turn back Cause I want to see my Jesus 